So I'm going to give you my theory here. So this whole video is just theory. So I've never done this before. So I'm going to give you a starting point of the judgment seat of Christ. So what I think is this. What I think will be the starting point of the judgment seat of Christ. So we're going through the church age here, right? That's today's day and age we're going through. And then here's the tribulation. And then after that, <coughs> excuse me. You've got the millennium here, which is 1,000 years. And then right here is the second advent, right, of Jesus Christ. So when I talk to you about the judgment seat of Christ, all I could tell you was that it's before second advent. That's it. And I couldn't get more detailed than that. But I'm going to give you one or maybe two theories. <clears throat> I believe this is that it's not going to be right before Second Advent. There could, there's going to be a time gap here before Second Advent. And then, I believe here is the gap, and that's the starting point, is when we get raptured. So in, in our rapture here before the tribulation, that's when the judgment seat of Christ starts. And then this event, which I'll tell you later what it is, and then after this event, then we come down second advent. All right, now I'm going to show you verses that will show it. First of all, let's look at 2 Corinthians 5. There's no doubt we have to go through the judgment seat of Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And notice right here what the Bible says at verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So Paul says we... So uh, he's a saved Christian. So he's referring to saved believers here. And he says, we all. So these are all saved Christians. All saved Christians go before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So notice right here that we're going to go before the judgment seat of Christ. And in this judgment seat of Christ, that's when God gives us the reward. That's when God, he uh, judges us and see what kind of crowns that we get. Now, we're not going to turn there for time's sake, but 1 Corinthians 3, when you turn over there, it shows you more detail about the judgment seat of Christ. You can earn a reward, and it's called that day. It's called like a particular day there. It says, the day shall declare it. There's going to be a day when God rewards us. Hence, that's why the Bible will say that day or the day when God rewards us. Because there's coming that D-day for us, so to speak. But in right here, it's very interesting that Paul, we know that he died a long time ago. Everyone can agree with that one, even an atheist. Paul died a long time ago. And when he died a long time ago, you know what he said? So when he died a long time ago, look at 2 Timothy 4. So the question is this. We don't know the starting point of judgment seat of Christ, right? That's what I originally taught. I don't know. I said it's possible it could be occurring right now, right? But here's the thing. My theory is that I don't think so. I think this is that it starts over here. Why? Because when Paul died, he's going immediately to heaven. And that judgment is future he referred it so when he said when he died he didn't say that when he died that he's going to be judged immediately he put it as a future tense so look at second timothy chapter four and then we'll look at verse eight second timothy four verse eight hence for uh verse seven uh verse six for i am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand so he's ready to die but look at this verse eight henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me. But he didn't say present tense. He puts it at when? At that day. See? So it's a future. Now remember, what's known as the day in the Bible when Christians get rewarded and crowned? It's a judgment seat, right? But keep reading here. At that day, and what's in the context? And not to me only, but unto all, uh, all them also that what? Love his what? Appearing. Appearing. See, so rapture. 
So it seems like right here that 2 Timothy 4, 8, that the judgment seat of Christ starts, see, it starts when he appears and raptures us up to heaven. <clears throat> but in the meantime, when we die, we go to heaven and enjoy our mansion up in heaven. Now you might say, why do you think so, Pastor? Because look at John 14. Look at John 14. John 14. It's a famous passage we all know, but like we've learned before, even a simple verse or a popular verse you know, sometimes you need to read it like 10, 20, 200 times for you to finally see something that you didn't see before. That's why that book, it can be read over and over again, and it will always show you something new. Ain't that a blessing? That ain't a boring book, man. You're holding a miracle. <laughs> now look at John chapter 14. <clears throat> Look at verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Okay, so Jesus is preparing that mansion for us. And if I go and prepare a place for you, look at this part. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know and the way ye know. So notice right here that Jesus Christ, he says right here that his intention is to have a mansion in heaven for us to enjoy, right? If he says it's his intention for us to enjoy the mansion in heaven, and he says that's why he's, com he's coming, right? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. So he's saying right here that when he comes down, he's going to come down so that we can enjoy our mansion in heaven. So here's a question. If that's the case that we're supposed to enjoy our mansion in heaven when he comes down to rapture us, how can we say that the judgment seat of Christ is occurring all the way here to the end of the tribulation and we don't have time to enjoy our mansion in heaven? See that? Because if you know dispensationalism, remember this. When we come down with Jesus Christ, are we in our mansion in heaven or ruling over the earth? We're ruling over the earth, right? For a thousand years. So that's the thing right here. He, when he comes down, he's supposed to make us enjoy our mansion in heaven. But not only that, it makes sense when Paul, Paul would say, that in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, which we looked at, 2 Corinthians 5, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And not only that, he said, if the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we got a house made in the heavens reserved for us. So immediately, see that? It shows an immediacy that as soon as your earthly body is dissolved, you're already up in heaven uh, with your house prepared right there. So it seems to show right here that we'll be enjoying it, see? So we'll be enjoying heaven, and then after that, the judgment seat of Christ. And then after that, um, what is this event? This event that happens is going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. But here's the thing, is that we already know that, so I'm not going to show you the verses on it. But here's the thing, it may not be as short of a time span as you think. That's why I put a length here. It may be longer than you think. The reason why is this. We saw the verse, but look at over there. Luke 12. Go to Luke 12. <clears throat> Luke chapter 12. Here's the point right here. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus comes down sometime at the end of the tribulation, and then he raptures them up, right? He raptures them up to heaven sometime at the end of the tribulation. But guess where he's returning from? He's returning from a wedding. See that? So he came from a wedding when he came down at the end of the tribulation. Thus, it shows there may be a significant longer time gap than you think. Now look at uh, Luke chapter 12. And verse 36, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord. So this is tribulation saints waiting for the tribulation rapture. So, so that people online don't get confused, we believe in two raptures. One for the Christian church, 
one for tribulation saints. So let's look at right here. Uh, men that wait for the Lord, when he will return from the what? Wedding, right? That's what it says, when he will return from the wedding. So when he returns from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. So notice right here that when he returns from the wedding, <laughs> that means the wedding was already ongoing that time. So the judgment seat of Christ, see, the point is this. It may be starting shorter and ending shorter than you think. That's what it seems like. Now, some of you probably can wipe the sweat off of your brow because y'all get... Because that's the thing that we get scared the most, right? Paul called it the care of the Lord. We're like, oh my goodness, you know, I, I, what about the judgment seat of Christ? You know, I'm scared about this and that and that. So the thing is this, it might be shorter of a time span than you think. But here's something else I also want to emphasize, how much shorter it might be. Look at Revelation 5. It may be really short than you think. So here's a, let's build another theory, okay? So here's another theory. This one's going to be probably be even more wild, actually. That's why this whole thing is theory, all right? Please do not base a doctrine out of this yet. This is a whole theory. But what I'm telling you is this. I'm giving you these verses because I want us Bible believers to study more of that book and be more familiar about the beginning and the ending timeline of the judgment seat of Christ. Because the judgment seat of Christ is the most important thing to a Christian, don't you think? After salvation, it's like the most important thing. Now let's look at Revelation chapter 4, and then look at what the verse says right here. At Revelation 4 verse 10. <clears throat> the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne. So notice right here, these four and twenty elders cast their crowns. But who are the four and twenty elders? It could be right here, look at chapter 5 and verse 9. It saved Christians. Chapter 5, verse 9, saved Christians. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So there's no doubt that's uh, us saved Christians. Uh, verse 8, if you look at verse 8, it mentions the four and twenty elders saying that. Okay, now here's a point right here. Okay, get ready for this. Revelation 5, what happens? They already received their rewards. Remember chapter 4? They're casting their what? Crowns. Paul said, I'm receiving my crown in that day. See? So they already received their crown right here. Now, this is what it, where it gets even more wild. This is what? Before chapter 6, verse 1. Chapter 5, they said, you're worthy to open the seal. So the first seal of the tribulation was not unleashed yet then with the Antichrist. The tribulation didn't even start. If you look at chapter 6, verse 1, the first seal is open. Chapter 4 and chapter 5, the 4 and 20 elders already have their crowns, their rewards, and they said, you're worthy to open the seal to start opening the seal so this this is where it gets really wild then it's like really short right here see that this judgment seat of christ but it also makes sense why when the bible talks about the rapture for christians it calls it the day the day of christ day of christ and it also calls the judgment seat of christ the day the day of christ isn't that interesting so then those things two things are intertwined so the word of god can mean it more literally than you think that the day of Christ, which is a rapture, truly is the judgment seat of Christ as well. But here's a question now. How in the world can God judge every saved Christian throughout all time in history within a short time span like that? The answer is actually easy for that one. So this one's an easy answer. Okay, everything else I think is hard and wild, but this one is not a difficult answer. Because let's be honest, Judgment seat of Christ, even if it goes through seven years of tribulation, that's still, you're cramming a lot right there. So this answer is more simple than you think. A day with the Lord is what? A thousand years. And a thousand years is what? One day, 2 Peter 3. That's why Jesus said, now this is an undoubtable fact, 
And I'm going to even give science too, scientific. Okay, This is a scientific fact too. Time is different <coughs> compared to Earth. When you go out toward the universe and space, time works very differently compared to here on Earth. Didn't you know that? And Jesus Christ, he says, I'm coming soon. I'm coming quickly. But then he mentioned to them, it's not for you to know the times and seasons. So that's why all the disciples and apostles, a lot of them were thinking right now, right now, right now, any moment right here. But Jesus Christ's timetable is different from them. Because one day to him, when he says, you know, I'm going to be coming soon, you know, it could be very different on the earth. It could be longer. And what's longer in heaven could be shorter on earth. Time is very different between the two. Do you think an om uh, omnipotent God is weaker than the universe, is weaker than the power of the universe to make time different at the judgment seat of Christ? See, that's not hard to believe. So while time is going very slow motion right here, probably 100 people were already judged. So that's not a problem with God. God can do that. He works with time and then... You got to realize this, even Revelation 4, look at that. That's first century AD, John's writing. He jumped him 2000, more than 2,000 years already like that in a blink of an eye. I mean, the Bible says it, he was caught up immediately, right? And boom, he saw all these things. So see, it's not a problem with God. By the way, let me tell you this. So here's an interesting one. This is a side note. I might do a teaching on this later. But here's a side note. Satan can do the, a similar thing too. What did he do with Jesus? He showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And this is where it connects to our other video. Satan, he's likened to electricity often, right? If Google, with all that electricity and technology, can show every event of a person's life like that when you type out the name, you think God is weaker? Do you think the devil is weaker? See that? So right here, it doesn't get you away, okay? So people who say, well, you know, oh, okay, I can get away at the judgment seat of Christ and get away with it like this. No, Paul called it terror for a reason, you got to understand, okay? So it's going to be a very terrible event and maybe a lot slower than you think. And as a matter of fact, you might, if I said the judgment seat of Christ started from there all the way to here, that would be better. You know why? Because you would think that time would be this long. But the judgment seat of Christ, if it works this kind of timetable, he can go longer than 2,000 years for all we know. If he goes through every instant of your life. There's a scary thing about the judgment seat of Christ, the terror of the Lord, so you don't want to take chances with that. That's very good advice for you, I can say.